an interesting uh, kind of a mystery in a way that I'll, I'll try to address. So the conditions in 2005 in the spring were so bizarre that uh, oceanographers that were doing work in the California Current that year ended up publishing a special issue of the uh, journal uh, Geophysical Research Letters. And there were probably 10 or 12 papers in there about all the weird things people had seen. And I'll go over some of those because they're, they're pretty amazing. So they did notice, um, these guys, that whales in 2005 were very skinny. And there's some pictures here. This is a nice chunky whale that they know. These things are known individually from their markings, so they can track them over time. And they, they're nice and fat along their back here normally. But in 2005, this whale, you can see it's really sunken in here, which means it, it, didn't, it wasn't getting enough to eat. It was getting uh, emaciated and maybe even starving. Um, a lot of my colleagues spend every spring on ships dragging nets around to catch the fish that eventually will recruit to the rockfish fishery, which they work on. But also these things are prey items for young salmon. And the top here shows uh, the total catches of a bunch of different kinds of fish that, that salmon can eat. And we see here in 2005 that it was really the lowest catches on record. They did not catch many rockfish uh, or sardines or any number of other things, anchovies. And this is actually the rockfish here. They caught almost none that year. So it was terrible in the ocean for rockfish. And rockfish don't have anything to do with rivers. A few of them do, but these ones typically don't. Uh, another really compelling piece of evidence are these um, Cassin's auklets, which breed on the Farallon Islands. And for the first time on record, there's a bird, a, the Point Reyes Bird Observatory uh, has scientists out there that every year count how many nests these things lay and how many eggs and whether they fledge successfully. In 2005, they, the auklets abandon their nests, they, which is what they do when they can't feed their chicks. They just give up and they fly away and try to save themselves. And it's the first year that they ever saw where the auklets completely abandoned all their nests. So those, there were no new auklets that year. And this is um, an important thing because the auklets eat exactly the same kinds of things that juvenile salmon do. They, they, they're like flying little salmon. Um, <laughs> So from that perspective, they're, they're even cuter too, actually. Another bizarre thing um, that uh, somebody saw, he used to, uh, Mike Weiss used to work at our lab, actually, uh, looking at sea lions and where they forage in the ocean. They put tags on these things. They can glue them to their fur, and they have a GPS and a radio, and they can report their location. And this on the left is a, a quite a, like, I think 22 male sea lions that forage. And this is the typical pattern. They stay very close to the coast normally. Uh, in 2005, they were going way offshore, presumably because there was nothing to eat for them onshore. So they're going way offshore to try to find something to eat. And some work by Bruce McFarlane at my laboratory, he did about nine years of sampling of juvenile salmon in the estuary and in the coastal ocean in the spring and the summertime. And he looked at the length of the fish, so they grow over time, not surprisingly. And the little boxes are the, uh, that show the average and the spread of the data over the nine years of his sampling. And the line along the bottom is what he saw in 2005. So we see that they were you know, near normal length and near normal weight in the estuary. But then in the ocean, they were small in the springtime. And one way of looking at this is by the condition factor, which is a ratio of their, their length to their weight. So when this is small, it means they're skinny. And that's not good. And we see that they were the skinniest that he'd ever seen them in 2005 in the springtime. Interestingly, when he was out in the late summer catching them, the ones that survived that were very typical again. So we don't know if they, they could catch up later when conditions got better. I, I showed you that the upwelling did, did get better eventually. Or whether it's just the big ones that may have that survived. Because uh, it, it pays to be big, typically, when you enter the ocean. Because there's a lot of things with big mouths. And if, if you're too big, they can't eat you. Uh, so we don't really know, but clearly they were unusually small and skinny in the ocean in the springtime. And uh, here's the survival data again. So in, in 2000, this is, uh, the index was one. It's just what we normalize it to. And by 2005, we're looking at about 5% survival rate compared to what we had seen just a few years earlier for these salmon, which were released into the bay and then uh, they caught later on. So they were never exposed to the river. So 
The conclusion that we had, and it's a little bit unsatisfying, this is a picture from the Klamath River, and the fish disaster there was partly kicked off by this fish kill in 2002, I believe, where the river was hot, and um, because there was uh, some fun shenanigans with, uh, you may remember, with uh, Dick Cheney, and they were getting ready for the election, and they were a bit um, trying to win the farmers' votes, and not figuring there were more farmers than fishermen, and they turned off the, the, um, the flow to the river to divert to the farms, and the fish died in the river, and the bodies are there. So you can know what killed them, and it, you can make a pretty good case about what the problem was. We don't have that. The bodies are gone. Um, but I hope I build a case that show you circumstantially we're pretty certain that, what, that they did die in the ocean, and it had something to do with these unusual conditions that were related to the, what was going on in the atmosphere that played out through the upwelling and the food web that supports salmon. So that basically, the juvenile salmon were expecting to arrive in the ocean and find their usual feast, and instead they had a famine. And that's what uh, did them in. But there is a, a question then of why did they collapse this time when this has happened before, even in our short period of observation, we've seen worse conditions. So you, you can either, there's sort of three possibilities and they're not mutually exclusive. One is it's just an unlucky confluence of events. It's just bad luck. And you know, hopefully we'll, we won't see this again in our lifetimes. The other is that the ocean is changing in some fundamental way. And we do know it's getting warmer. And it, I'll show you that it may be changing as well in other ways. And then finally, the fish may be changing as well. So I'll go over these ideas, at least the, uh, about the ocean. So one way you can look at what's going on in the ocean is by, oh, I'm sorry, question. Yeah, in freshwater and in the estuary, yes. And then, and, and so, and then the conclusion here is something about the way you have to eat. So yes. I'm, I'm missing the link. Okay. Repeat the question. So the, the question is, I, I did point out that the net pen acclimatization was different in 2005. And, but, and I'm, I'm I sort of skipped over something that I, I meant to make a point. So you see that the survival in 2005 of these hatchery fish is lower than 2004, although the environmental conditions in the ocean I don't think were as bad. And I think that that net pen problem may largely explain why this survival is even lower. But I think that's about as far as it goes. If they had acclimated all of those fish in the net pens, the survival might have been like it was in 2004, or maybe a little bit higher, but it certainly wouldn't be um, back up to what we would expect to see. And we looked at that very carefully. The, the effect, uh, it's actually measurable what the net pen does. It boosts survival by about 30%. Um, so it's, it's in, important, but not important enough to explain the very poor survival. Okay. So um, the ocean is changing. This is a, an analysis of sea surface temperatures. And it's done on detrended data. The first trend that's taken out is the annual rise in sea surface temperature, which is well documented. The ocean's getting warmer. It's due to the earth getting warmer, which is mostly due to greenhouse gas emissions. That's going on. But after you correct for all of that, there are different modes of variability that are left in there. One is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's a very important driver, as everyone in California knows. There's another thing called the El Nino Modoki, which is a recently discovered phenomena, which the normal El Nino is an east-west thing going on in the Pacific. The El Nino Modoki is like that, but it's a north-south. And this is a picture, it, it, it's this mode four, the oceanographers call it, and you notice that the intensity of it is getting bigger and bigger over time. And this is a really important mode of variability in the ocean because it, it controls the amount of nutrients that are brought up by the upwelling, and it has effects also on the winds. So for some reason, and it may be a signal of, of global climate change, this mode of variation in the ocean is getting more intense, and it has a direct link to salmon food webs. So this is um, a bit alarming. So what about the fish? I did tell you before that um, Chinook salmon in California aren't what they used to be. They're all fall run Chinook salmon now. We used to have these other species and we don't have them anymore. And they differ, um, they give their names because of the timing that they enter the ocean after they, they're maturing, they come back uh, either in the fall, later in the fall, in the winter or in the spring, pretty much year round they come back. But they do a lot of other different things, too. They go to different places in the watershed. They utilize different habitats. 
Um, that's the problem for most of them because they use uh, high elevation areas and they spend some part of their life in the summertime in the river. And the only place, uh, salmon are cool water fish, so they need to be at high elevations and the dams are on almost all the rivers that they use, so they can't get there anymore. So these populations are tiny fractions of their abundance. And what this biodiversity can give a fishery is what economists and fishery scientists now call a portfolio effect. So just like your um, 401k, hopefully, you've uh, heeded the advice of the financial gurus, that diversification is very important. If you have a well-diversified portfolio, you reduce the volatility of the portfolio while maintaining your potential for growth. It doesn't mean there won't be years, uh, as we've seen, where your portfolio will go down, but it's better to have a broadly diversified portfolio than have all your stock in Enron or something like that, uh, because it can go completely away. And so I think one of the big problems we have in the Sacramento River is that we have lost a big component of our portfolio's diversity. So these fish, especially, this is a, a schematic of when they um, do their different things. And this rearing and migration time, you see for fall run, they're um, coming out in May and June. And uh, late fall run are coming out uh, at a totally different time of the year. So if conditions are bad in the ocean, because of the timing being off, for fall run Chinook, they might be good for another one. So if you have fish, a, a broad diversity of fish that are using different places at different times, uh, some will do badly under some conditions, but others will find that an opportunity. And that will smooth out the volatility in your fishery. Uh, do any of these uh, run revert or acclimatize to becoming something else, like a winter run offspring becoming it's yes and no. It's an evolutionary process. So they can, this timing can change, especially the timing. Uh, the fall run Chinook were taken to New Zealand, and now they're adapted to a completely reversed seasonal thing down there. So they can adjust the timing. But some of these other things about um, the habitat use and whatnot probably is, is an evolutionary legacy of, of 10,000 years age. So it doesn't happen too quickly. Um, especially if there's no habitat for them to do it in. So I, I said before the dams, so this is what here, what's going on uh, that's preventing this diversity from really occurring in a meaningful and functional way in the system anymore are these dams. This is Shasta Dam. It blocks uh, all the historical habitat used by winter Chinook. They persist in the cold water that's released below this dam. And this is Orville Dam on the Feather River. And I think this is uh, Friant Dam on the San Joaquin. So uh, huge swaths of formerly productive salmon habitat that supported these other runs are off the table right now. Then in the remaining areas downstream, where fall Chinook still persists, so the, one important point about fall Chinook is they don't spend any time in the river in the summer. They come in in the fall, they lay their eggs, and the juveniles leave in the spring before it gets hot, and they, they take advantage of these lowland areas. But we've changed those too. And these are pictures of the, the diking and channelization, uh, bank armoring, that's just widespread throughout the lower river reaches. And this, none of this is good for juvenile salmon rearing and growth. So um, it's really curtailing the opportunities for the fish to do different things. Now they're restricted mostly to living in a hatchery or doing things that are, that are timed to go along with that. And this is a picture of what goes on in a hatchery compared to what happens in nature. On the left here are, are people, uh, they basically slit open the fish that they pick and put together the milt and the eggs. And uh, salmon in, in nature choose their mates probably very carefully. They have some ideas about what they're looking for. They can, they can tell who's a sibling, we, we think. So they don't mate with their brothers and sisters. And um, they sort things out in a very complicated way. They don't get an opportunity to do that in a fish hatchery. People choose. Then they, rather than living in the gravel here, they live in these little trays in a warehouse. And then they're in a, here with Elmo in a big raceway where they're fed um, food fish chow basically from the surface rather than foraging for insects and whatnot. And rather than swim down the river, they go down in this gleaming truck down the freeway where they're then dumped in these net pens. So all of that selection, natural selection, which would make them fit to live in the wild, at least in the freshwater, they skip all that. And it's, uh, the worry about that is it's something like what happened to water buffalo. Now we have cows. They're not particularly fit to live in the wild either, although they used to be a wild animal. And because they've adapted to what people want of them, there's a trade-off for that. They, they do well in our environment, but not in, in the wild. And this is a, a big worry for salmon, that eventually this can happen. 
So uh, about back to the, this portfolio effect. It actually still exists, oddly enough. Yes? What's the biodiversity in the hatcheries? I mean, is it all fall run? Or yes. Run? It's why, why all there, fall run. Why isn't there a mix of the other kinds of salmon? They do try a little bit. to. So there's a conservation hatchery for winter Chinook. But these are very challenging to grow because they have a life uh, stage in the summertime. And you need cool, fresh water, which is a valuable commodity. It's just technically challenging to keep the fish in the summer. So they, they did uh, make a conscious decision when they blocked off uh, all this habitat that was mostly for spring Chinook to mitigate that by building hatcheries for the fall Chinook because they're more tractable for rearing in captivity. Um, and then the other thing about hatcheries is they're kind of industrial processes and they're uh, about producing as many as they can as most efficiently as they can and that means standardizing your procedures figuring out what the most effective thing is and just tuning it all the time. And they've converged onto the same processes and these, there are about three big hatcheries and they all do the same thing so they're making the same product and it's like a giant cornfield in Iowa that can be devastated by the outbreak of something. There's really no diversity there so they're, they're vulnerable potentially to that. But in spite of all of this, uh, there is a portfolio effect. I'll go over this pretty quickly. But if you look at the coefficient of variation, a measure of variability in the returns of the salmon, uh, on average for populations, it's quite high. They're very variable. But if you add together all the fish in a run, that coefficient of variability drops. So this is your portfolio effect. There's a lot of variability in the estimate of that for the Central Valley because for winter Chinook, there's only one population. For uh, spring Chinook, there's just a, a handful. Um, and then when you add all the fish together, that the variability of that, those total returns is quite a bit lower than you'd expect if they all did exactly the same thing. Um, I'll actually just skip that. This is just a bunch of plots. So what, what, you would sh what that does show is something broke down about this, though. So even for fall Chinook, there was a portfolio effect. And you can measure that by looking at the correlations among the populations. So I've done that here. If a correlation is 1, it means they do exactly the same thing. They're lockstep up and down over time. If it's minus one, they do exactly the opposite thing. If they're totally unrelated, the correlation is zero. And because they have the same life history and they do use the same habitats so and whatnot, we'd probably expect some correlation because they're living in the same environment. And this is the distribution of that. So we see they tend to, to track each other when you look at the, the data record from the last three decades. But if you look at just the very last decade, the correlation among fall Chinook has increased a lot. So this is the collapse of our, our portfolio effect within fall Chinook, which is what supports the fishery. And very interestingly, when you look among these other remnant populations, their correlation was less, and it hasn't changed. And um, these fish, while they're a tiny fragment of their former glory, are persisting in natural environments, and they've been subject to a lot of restoration activities, especially some of these spring Chinook populations. People have done some great stuff for the habitat there, uh, and they didn't collapse through this period of bad uh, conditions. The, the spring Chinook held on much better, and then the late fall Chinook, which have a very different uh, timing of ocean entry, actually have been going up through all this period. So what's, what's the problem with fall Chinook? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do probably with what's going on in fish hatcheries. And this is just a plot of how many, the fraction of fish coming back in the hatchery that, are, that came from a hatchery. And we see that that's rising over time. It used to be very small, only 5% of the fish entering the hatchery were probably, had been born in the hatchery, and now it's um, maybe 30%. Actually, this is um, the rate, this is the fraction of fish coming into hatcheries compared to all the fish coming back to the river. So actually, we think now that the amount of fish that are uh, coming back into the hatchery that came from a hatchery is probably well over 90%. So the whole thing is driven by a hatchery, by three hatcheries, doing the same things. And I thought the problem was there's no food in the ocean. Well, that's what happened this year. Right, or th in these bad years. So this, this hatchery issue uh, also gives rise to very good years as well. It's a boom and bust thing. So when conditions line up, like they did it for the 2002 returns, those hatchery fish, when everything was to their, suit, their liking, they do great. Um, and then when conditions are, are poor, they don't do so well. And I'll come up, I'll get back to this, I think, a little bit. So the question actually was uh, that the problem is the ocean, right? So why, what's the deal with hatcheries? Yes? How do we know where the fish came from originally? They're marked now. So they're, they clip off the little uh, adipose fin on their back. And actually, some, a lot of them get tagged. And actually, you can, you can track them genetically as well. So you can actually know exactly where they came from if you want to. 
Uh, and this is a plot that just shows here the black dots are the returns that are coming back to the Sacramento River, which is where they used to all go. And the little diamonds are, are this little creek, Battle Creek, which is a very small stream. And historically, not many fish were spawning in Battle Creek. And now, most of them spawn there. And what's interesting about Battle Creek, this is where the Coleman National Fish Hatchery is operating. So these are fish that are coming back to the hatchery, but the hatchery only needs so many for their, uh, their, their program, and the rest are left in the river. So we're seeing that while overall the abundance of fish coming back is about the same, the, they're all coming to the hatchery now where they used to go to the river. So the system is it's just switching over from something that was natural production, which would have uh, a lot of properties that would support biodiversity, to one that's dominated by hatcheries, which has no mechanisms really for supporting diversity the way they're typically operated. Um, another uh, sort of subtle effect that hatcheries have is because they, they feed the fish a lot to make them grow quickly, they then mature earlier. And this is a, a plot here of their typical age at return. And the blue bars are hatchery fish, and the pink ones are wild. And uh, having a truncated age distribution, more fish coming back over a fewer range of years, increases this volatility of the return and aggravates the problem of booms and busts. So that's, well, that's one of the things that, that's going on as well. So this is probably the most important slide of the, the talk, which is a kind of a, a conceptual picture of what I think is going on with salmon in California. And this probably applies to Washington and Oregon and British Columbia as well, not yet to Alaska, um, which is why we have a uh, nice sockeye in the markets. So the typical history here at the, at the above is a decline in natural production of the rivers, which is driven by our water and land use practices as, as people build on floodplains and build dams for their irrigation and urban uses and industrial uses. It degrades the system which produces salmon naturally. That gets to a point that becomes annoying to fishermen. So the solution typically then is to build fish hatcheries to make up for that. So the hatcheries come online and they start producing fish. The downside of that, I suspect, is that the fitness of these fish declines due to the effects of domestication. And then we have a climate effect. And this could come from the uh, increasing variability in the ocean due to climate change, or it could be just the sensitivity of the fish to the climate due to this loss of the portfolio effect. And when you add these together, you get this picture at the bottom, that this, uh, these natural oscillations of the environment uh, that are completely normal, and then an amplification of that over time due to the effects of this increasing susceptibility to climate variability. And you have a long-term trend going down that's easily obscured by these year-to-year -year fluctuations in abundance. And this is probably another very important take-home message. People will tell you because the ocean is responsible for driving this variability that whatever they're doing on the land or with the water is not to be blamed. And this is a complete red herring. This is, do not believe this. I, I don't know if people don't understand that or if they're willfully lying, uh, but they're wrong. That is just, it's flatly wrong, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. That year to year, the salmon go up and down like mad, but there is this indisputable long-term decline. And where we're at here right now is with this number one. We're at a, at a nadir, and I predict that the population will come back. We'll have a salmon season again next year or the year after or in three years. They'll come back. But they won't come back probably as high as they used to come back. And when conditions again turn bad, they will go down again lower. And if nothing changes here, they're going to go extinct eventually. Maybe not in our lifetime, but this is not a sustainable trajectory. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, you, from this model, you really need to correct these underlying problems, which is the decline in natural production. That means fixing freshwater and estuarine habitats. We have a lot of programs, a lot of money spent in California to do that. Um, and that's the right direction to go. The other thing is, uh, you know, hatcheries are an important part of the fishery. Can we operate them in a way that doesn't degrade the fitness of the natural populations? And I think there are improvements that can be made there so that we can have fisheries in the meantime, uh, that, so we can go fishing and buy fish in the market. So why don't we just do this? Here, we're the government. We can, uh, we can fix things, right? <laughs> so it, it turns out, we do know how, actually, but it's a political process as well. And the government, of course, everything we do has a legal mandate. We're in the executive uh, branch of the government, and our work is driven by really two laws. There are many more that we're responsive to, but the main one is the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and the other one is the Endangered Species Act. And interestingly, these come from, um, they have different goals. The Magnuson Act is about building sustainable fisheries. The ESA is about making things uh, 
not go extinct. And they have different conceptual foundations. The, the Magnuson Act is all about ideas like sustainable, maximum sustainable yield. And it's what I would characterize as production thinking. And in this kind of way of thinking about it, a fish is a fish. So a fish from a hatchery is just as good as a fish from nature. And the more the better, and however that happens, doesn't really matter. We want productive fish, fisheries with a lot of fish. Um, and there's a whole mathematical uh, way of thinking about that and of, of managing fisheries, and that's how it's done. And the Magnuson Act has enormous power over fisheries. They can shut, they did shut down the fishery. They can, they can do whatever they want to the fisheries. But they have no power over these other problems, which are the ultimate causes of what's going on with salmon, unlike, um, you know, ground fish on the East Coast, where it really is just a fishing problem, a very complicated one. Um, so they have very low power over these other factors. The ESA does have um, some moderate power over fisheries. It's actually not as powerful regulator of fisheries as the Magnuson Act is. Uh, but it has relatively high power, potentially, over other activities that influence fish. And the agency it has um, you know, whole divisions that kind of are devoted to these different strands of the law. And you might notice there are a bit of conflict. One is about catching fish and eating them, and the other is about preventing them from dying. So we struggle with that as an agency and as a society, really. So what's the solution to this? I'm going to skip this. Um, this is a, a schematic of what people call ecosystem-based management. And this is what we're trying to do to, so that we can bring in our considerations of the ecosystem, the, the food webs and the things that people do to the habitat of fish. And this is really the bread and butter of what I do, which is in the middle section of this, of building models that can make predictions and they they describe hypotheses, and we can come up with plans and modifications to the systems, and we can monitor things and learn. And all that's very important. It's very complicated and difficult, and that's what we're paid to do. Um, but the most fundamental part of ecosystem-based management is this thing at the top, which is the restoration goals. And this is not a scientific process. This is a societal issue. It's up for the public to decide what kind of a California do we want to have in the future. Do we want to have salmon in 50 years? Or do we want to have cheap cotton or something in between? And I would argue, you know, probably that there's a balance there. Um, and this is where it, it comes in for you as people of the informed public. You're going to see bonds coming up in California for the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. And you've seen other water bonds. There are habitat restoration actions in there. Um, these, there are opportunities, and I think there was a handout about this, uh, groups like the Tuolumne River Trust are very active in trying to influence these restoration goals. And this is a public process. If the public can tell us what they want the future to look like, we have the tools to work towards that. Um, but it's, it's up to, to people. And it's typically the, the, the what are, you know, special interests are the people who are at the table of these. These are the people who have a strong interest in an extreme outcome where they garner the benefit and they put the cost on everybody else. And, it, it can be that when you have all of the interests there that you'll come up with a compromise that's, that's suitable for the public at large, but it's really a brutal way of, of going about this. It's done in the, the legal system predominantly, and I hate going to court. Uh, it sometimes happens, and I wish I, well, there's got to be a more productive way of doing it because it's very, very expensive, very slow, and very unpleasant. People get very angry, uh, and it would be better if we could just work together, but that's a, kind of a dream for our country these days, it seems. So with that, I think, um, yeah, just to, to point out, this was not just my work, but a, a bunch of, of my colleagues uh, throughout the West Coast, Fishery Service and elsewhere. And this is a, a report you can download from the web. And anyway, with that, I'll take any questions. Oh, actually, there'll be a, a drawing. Yeah. We'll so first off, thank you. So yeah, so from. All right. From Kepler's, we have a, a drawing for $30, so. Our winner is Beth Violet. Beth? <laughs> Congratulations. And um, we'll, we'll take questions now, obviously. And um, please either raise your hand or walk to one of these microphones, because that will help. Uh, if I can bring you a microphone, it'll help so that everyone can hear the questions. Okay, yes. You said British Columbia is kind of on the same track as we are. How about Alaska? You didn't say much about that. Alaska, so did everyone hear the question? It was the, yeah. okay. Yeah, Alaska is really the polar opposite of what's been going on uh, in the lower areas. They still have very good systems for producing salmon. Bristol Bay, 
Sockeye is probably the most productive salmon fishery in the world. It's largely pristine. Currently, uh, there are 100 million fish typically caught there in a couple weeks, as opposed to a million or so Chinook on our coast. It's not secure, though. There's uh, plans to build some big mines there that could have devastating impacts on those watersheds. But currently, they're pristine, and there really aren't a lot of hatcheries up there. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, why do we truck the fish, and could they be released later or earlier if we knew the conditions were different? So the trucking is thought, this is maybe folklore, um, that by, obviously, we've completely hosed the river, so we should put the fish in a truck and take them away around the river and put them in the bay. And this can work really well. Sometimes they get amazing survivals out of that. Um, but Coleman National Fish, Hat Fish Hatchery has typically released their fish directly to the river, and they get very good survivals too. So I think it's a, just an accepted wisdom that this is, needs to be done, and also it looks good because we're doing something. Um, so yeah, our agency is dead against this. It causes a lot of problems I didn't get into. We don't like it. It's not. We think it would be better for the fish to be in the river. And the other question, um, holding, the holding the fish. So that, that could be something in the future. We actually have a project now that's trying to forecast ocean conditions. You, you need to know in advance, and we're building a system that can maybe make forecasts in nine months in the future. But this phenology issue of when exactly things happen, it's very hard for the atmospheric and ocean models to predict that. So the, I think the better idea would be to release them over a broader period, rather, because right now they're released over a very narrow window of time that they found on average is optimal. So, you know, you give up on, on hitting the jackpot, but spread it out a little bit more. Yeah. So Actually, the guy behind you there in the, in the green shirt. How, oh, sorry. How does, how does the data for the Yuba compare? Oh, excuse me. How does the data for the Yuba compare with your overall picture? Is it distinctly different, or is it pretty much the same? Mostly, there's not a lot going on in the Yuba. It's... Um, there well, used the only to be thing going on in the Yuba is completely natural spawning, no hatcheries, catch and release. It's as close as California can come to creating.